Well, good evening, everybody. I wanted to welcome you here to the lodge. Once again, we are providing you with a fabulous, fabulous lecture this year. Um, Nancy Bartlett, I should say Mrs. Bartlett, because I've known her since I was quite small, so she calls Mrs. Bartlett. But I'll try to call her Nancy a couple of times. Um, as you know, Nancy is, she was vice chair, or currently is vice chair of the Historic Preservation Board here in Los Alamos, has been president of the Los Alamos Historical Society's Board, has many, many accolades, which I have right here, which I'm not going to read all of them, <laughs> but I will just mention a couple of them, that she, uh, she graduated from Smith College, and then she taught school in a Japanese girls' academy just 13 years after the end of World War II, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, she, uh, she's co-authored quite a few different books with different people, um, working on one of her own right now, right? Silent Voices. Okay, Silent Voices, which we hope to, will be out, is that September? In June. In June, okay. Well, we hope to have her back in September too, so catch us for that one. Um, wanted to let you know too that she, I lost my place, sorry about that. She's done so many things, um, been working with a lot of people here in Los Angeles was very responsible back actually for the statues out here, correct? Yeah, so all of our two favorite people here in Los Alamos, she was responsible for getting those statues out. She has, is going to be presenting a great talk tonight on Deep Parsons. She has had a lot of help. She and Roger Mead worked together quite a bit on this. Roger was, as you guys know, was the um, National Labs archivist and historian for quite a few years, and he's working his story for the chemistry division's radio chemistry assessment team right now. He was hired in 84, and he had expanded the laboratory's nested archives into an unparalleled resource for both scientific and historical research. He later became co-author of Critical Assembly, which you guys haven't read that, you should read it. It will be available in the museum shop here later this year. Other than that, I think I'm going to turn it over because you guys are probably tired of listening to me talk. Real quick, just an update on the Oppenheimer House. The county has finally approved our first phase plan. Yeah. We can actually start with the building. We a lot of problems, just a lot of hoops to jump through, but now we're, we just want to do it right. So we've got the money for it. We will be asking everybody later in the year for help for the second phase, which will be later on. I'll let you know about that. But right now, Oh, yes, thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Nancy let me know earlier this morning or yesterday that she has sand from both Iwo Jima and Tini Island, which we are going to auction off tonight to the highest bidders. Oh. So get your wallets out. This will all go to the Oppenheimer House, okay? So we will, awesome. we'll do this afterwards. So right now, I just want to present Mrs. Bartlett, Mrs. <laughs> Nancy Bartlett. I want to thank you all for coming. I, you just come back from spring break, and to come tonight, I really appreciate it. I'm honored to be here, and I'm honored to be working with, with uh, Roger Mead, who gave me his PowerPoint. He would love to be here tonight with you, but he couldn't come, so we've been collaborating for the last month after I got a call from Todd asking uh, to substitute for the speaker who is supposed to be here tonight. So that's why you see the Los Alamos National Lab background on our, our PowerPoint. Um, he said, it's OK. I won't get in trouble with the lab for using it. And uh, when I looked at the, finally could get through and look at the DVD of this recording, he had given this talk at the Bradbury Science Museum. And I saw myself and my husband sitting there. And I think uh, the Strict Fadens were there. It was in 2009 at the Bradbury Science Museum. But I have injected my, some of my ideas and my slides, so that's why we've collaborated. And if you have any problem hearing, I, please raise your hand. And we'll try to take care of technology right away. Um, Roger says, World War II made many people famous. Three such persons are shown here, General Dwight Eisenhower and Dr. Robert Oppenheimer and Admiral Chester Minutes. Before the war, they were known only by their colleagues, pretty much. Um, now, I have a problem. 
I want to call them Oppie and Groves. Is that all right? I don't have to say Dr. Dr. Oppenheimer and General Groves each time um, because that's the way we feel towards both of our, our gentlemen who are our statues out there. Um, Eisenhower wasn't known, he was known uh, within, internally, but according to what Roger has written, he was not known, the um, re reporters didn't know how to spell his name until after he led the invasion to North Africa. And Admiral Mi Nimitz was um, uh, a submarine person and he rescued submarines. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, he was sent to Hawaii by FDR, and then he was made commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. And that included water and land. And so he, he was raised up uh, because of his abilities. The FDR knew him personally. Now, if uh, you go to Fort Sumner, you will, um, you will see this sign, the village of Fort Sumner, home of Rear Admiral William S. Deke Parsons, the atomic admiral. Ever since I went to Fort Sumner in 2006 to give a lecture to sixth graders up to 12th graders, I became fascinated by Deke Parsons and his role in New Mexico's history of World War II. When I showed the picture of Deke Parsons that you see there, all the kids cheered and they knew him and they were so excited. And then I put up the picture of Oppenheimer and nobody knew who he was. <laughs> now that was many years ago. And so I, I committed myself to telling the story about Deke. I didn't know all the story, but I knew some of the story. And I felt that he was, not, he was not well known, and I would like to see the kids in Los Alamos schools cheer when they see his face. That's my goal. Wait a minute, something skipped. Here we go. He was born on November 26th. 1901 in Chicago, Evanston, Illinois. His family was wealthy, but uh, his father was, was seduced, I guess, by real estate people who tried to get the West populated. And he decided to move to Fort Sumner. He put all the belongings, the household belongings, in a, a, a railroad car and came out. Um, and he, um, so he wanted to make his fortune. His mother went to Smith College, which you heard was my alma mater. And I'm uh, going to my reunion n next month. And Smith was founded in 1871. And for Deeks Parson to have gone to Smith puzzles me. I'm going to try to learn more about it and go see the archivist in uh, the college because Dorothy McKibben went to Smith and Peggy Pond Church went for two years before she married Firmer. So there's a story here. Now Fort Sumner's history must have been known to Deke's father as it was the place that Kit Carson bought the Navajos on the long march. The hopes for their successful farming were dashed by insects, lack of water, and improper soil, a disaster for the Navajos and the Apache groups who were brought there. And Fort Sumner is the place where Billy the Kid was killed. 10 years later, after Deke was moved to Fort Sumner, he graduated at the age of 16. He was a prodigy, he was a math genius, and uh, he applied to enter the Naval Academy, and he was accepted. But when he showed up, he was too short, and they said, you can't come. And he said, well, obviously I can, because I'm going to grow taller, and I'm going to grow heavier, 
and so he was accepted. <laughs> he graduated 48th out of 539 in his class. In contrast, the brains of the Navy, Admiral Hyman Rickover graduated 150th in his class. So at the academy, he acquired the name Deke as a play on his last name. I think this is working better than this, but. So upon graduation from the academy in 1922, Parsons was assigned to the battleship USS Idaho, where he commanded one of the main 14-inch gun turrets. Parsons worked independently to improve gun accuracy, and the USS Idaho became the best shooting ship in the Navy. Now, check the upper row of guns. And let's see. This is on, and this should work. I believe that would be where he worked. He had no girlfriends. He didn't date. He was on a ship for a number of years uh, before he even um, paid attention to girls. Um, he, he attended the Navy's postgraduate school, which firmly placed his career in engineering. As a result, he was eventually posted at the Naval Proving Ground, where he oversaw the continued development of naval cannons and, more importantly, became the project manager for both radar and the proximity fuse development. He also attended the Applied Physics Laboratory in Sil Silver Springs, Maryland. At the Naval Proving Ground, Dahlgren, Virginia, he met Jer and Hel Hel Helene Sudam, the former owners of the Oppenheimer House, from whom we bought the house. And in fact, there's a story that Larry Campbell told that, that is on our recording that Gene Jindro did years ago in 2009 when, when uh, Roger gave a talk. And he talks about an outing that the newlyweds had and uh, I think they were vote captized or something, and he, they were rescued by Deke Parsons. And Deke Parsons also met Norris Bradbury at that time, and that was a fortuitous encounter. Can you see it with the light on, the slides? Okay, um, this map shows the, of the strategic problems facing the United States in 1942. The Pacific had become a Japanese lake. Of the particular note is the red line called by the Japanese the Z line. And um, the, in the north it was anchored by the Aleutian Islands and extended down to the Marshall Islands and New Guinea. I think you all can see where those are. The Japanese hoped to defend this line and make war too costly for the United States to prosecute. The nastiest tactical problem facing the United States Navy was the shooting down of fast attack aircraft. It could be done, but only with the expenditure of very large quantities of ammunition. Some estimates ran as high as 4,000 rounds per plane shot down. And it was not always possible, particularly when the Japanese employed suicide tactics called kamikaze. And here you can see um, how many rounds it takes to shoot down a plane. And so part of the answer was shooting, to shoot down the fast track aircraft rested with this advanced new technology, the proximity fuse. Uh, has anyone here in the audience worked on the proximity f fuse here at the lab? No. Um, when Don Keir invited me to spend one meeting a month to be on the society board, he told me, you have to learn about the proximity fuse. And he passed away before I learned what he wanted to teach me. Excuse me, I'm really dry here. 
A proximity fuse is a fuse that detonates an explosive device automatically when the distance to the target becomes smaller than a predetermined value. Proximity fuses are designed for targets such as planes, missiles, ships at sea, and ground forces. So we combined uh, radar with these fuses that were screwed on to the top of whatever was going to be shot out. And um, they exploded not on, they didn't have to make contact with the target. They exploded near the target, and that explosion is what knocked the planes out of, out of the air. As a project engineer, Parsons was responsible under combat conditions. So in, uh, in early December 43, he boarded the USS Helena and authorized the use of the fuses in combat of Guadalcanal and the Pacific. The fuses were used in Helena's five-inch gun seen here on the side of the ship, and the test proved successful. Their guns shut down five of seven planes. Unfortunately, after he came back, the USS Helena was sunk. Now, um, Parsons, Parsons' work on the proximity fuse extended to the European theater as well. Although for a time the fuse was used only over water so that a dud could not be found by the enemy and reversed engineered. But the, law, like, the United States lost 30,000 fighting men in Europe. And um, so it was allowed to be used on land. Number one, to shoot down V-1 rockets. Two, to drive the Germans out of Hurtigen Forest and then blunt the German offensive in the Battle of the Bulge. And as General Patton's quote shows on the slide, a little known Navy captain had a major influence on the war in the Europe. So when Los Alamos was organized in 1943, it faced the problem of how to translate, and notice, translate, the process of fission into a combat weapon. Fission, once discovered, was relatively simple in concept, but difficult to engineer into a weapon of war. Now, those aren't my words. Those are Rogers. <laughs> now, how to get from the left to the right in terms of this fission and the chain reaction? This process was named translation. Someone who knew how to do it needed to be invited to join the project. So, to solve the translation problem at Los Alamos, General Leslie Groves, commanding general of the Manhattan Project, hired Parsons. As Project Y gathered scientists to join the research for the atomic bombs, ordnance engineers were few and far between. As an aside, Groves should receive credit, despite his reputation, for being able to think outside the box when it came to getting a job done. He had no problem hiring a naval officer for an army project. When Parsons arrived in Los Alamos in 43 with his wife Martha and two daughters, one might believe that his first order of business was to begin work on Little Boy and Fat Man, but not so. He immediately recognized how, how people live is just as important as what they do. So he pushed Oppie and, um, to, um, and Groves to improve the roads. Now, Groves thought that poor roads would discourage visitors and tourism <laughs> and thereby be an important security feature. But, but uh, Parsons got him to take the old roads out and put in new ones. He worked to improve housing to make a livable community, even redesigning apartment floor plans but he lost the battle with the University of California to change the design of the Sunt buildings. He hired teachers, including a kindergarten teacher, as, and he served on the school board. Doesn't that sound like Oppie? Uh, the family lived in the home built by Firmer and Peggy Pond Church across the street from the home where the Oppenheimers lived. 
<clears throat> it's now owned uh, privately. Mrs. Martha Parsons was the daughter of a Navy admiral, and she was used to entertaining, so she was also known to often host events here. Uh, her father was an admiral under which Deke served in one of his times out to sea. So then he turned his mind to the create an ordnance division. There was no such thing when he arrived. The original division, can you see? Maybe you can't see. Um, one of the men that was under him was Mr. McMillan, who won the Nobel Prize in 1951 for physics. And the other is Norman Ramsey, down at the bottom, 18, 1989 physics. And the two of them worked for him under the ordinance. Now, this ordinance, this photo gives an idea of the fat man translation problem going from this early experiment to crushing sewer pipes with high explosives in the final product. To be fair, Parsons was not happy with Fat Man. It was far too complicated for his engineering mind, and it caused him uh, his one tangle with Groves and Oppenheimer. At one point, Parsons argued for a scheme to simplify the physics package of Fat Man. It was promptly told to stick to engineering details. Both Little Boy and Fat Man went through many design changes before becoming the final product. This photo was taken in Utah. The image shows one of the earliest Little Boy models. I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's uh, not as clear as it should be, but the, this design was more like Thin Man. A couple, a couple of fat man uh, shapes can be seen in the background. Most of the work on Little Boy took place at Gunsight TA6 and outside year round. It was, you just put in a few kilograms of uranium and then you explode it, says Roger. He comments that many people don't appreciate the hard physical labor that went into building the first atomic bombs, thinking only of scientists working in laboratories with white shirts, coats, I guess. It was nasty, dirty work, and Oppie didn't understand what it was. He didn't understand the process. An early model of little boys being re readied for suspension from a cable in the early form of flight testing uh, this is before the B-29s were brought in. These particular suspensions tested antennas. Note the bizarre looking tail. And that's because Los Alamos never, during the war, hired an aeronautical engineer. Um, they did after the war, after the war. So that's a problem they had with the way the bombs would fall. Engineering considerations included testing of all components. Here a little boy model is shown suspended in the air for test of its radar components. And here is an early Fat Man model also being suspended for tests on its radar. In addition to his engineering management at the lab, Parsons made a decision that perhaps ensured the post-war survival of the lab. He hired Norris Bradbury. Bradbury, a Naval Reserve officer as well as a scientist, took over the final development of Fat Man and is seen here in his Trinity shots. But Bradbury's most important role was in saving the lab after the war. Oppie, captured the dire predicament of the lab in November 1945. Some have written that while Oppie created the lab, Norris Bradbury was its savior. If that is true, then it is because of Parsons that are, we are here today. You can read the things. 
Although Parsons spent most of his time with the technical development of the bomb, he was never far from his military uh, responsibilities. Here is a letter from Groves complaining about the poor state of military dress of the naval people in Los Alamos. It's hard to read, but he says, I will, I will, uh, I will take action at the next meeting of the naval officers and went on his way. He knew enough of the politics of the military and the science to not get upset about small matters. Now, because of the possibility of damage from the explosion caused by two ammunition ships at Port Chicago, California, might be of some usefulness in collecting data, Parsons was sent to assess and characterize the damage which had exploded during the loading of ammunition. It killed about 300 stevedores. It was thought that the Port Chicago disaster on July 17, 1944 would provide some idea of the damage to be expected from Little Boy and Fat Man. But actually, it was so bad, the damage was so bad that they could not learn too much from it. Now, the Port Chicago disaster killed all of the black Navy enlisted personnel who were loading the ships. So, subsequently, over 200 black sailors refused to return to their jobs as stevedores and were court martialed for mutiny. This is a sad chapter in our history. And um, at the time that, that uh, Roger gave this talk, there had been a congressional approach to um, change the um, mutiny, the court marshalling, the court martial decision, which is sort of similar to what has happened to Oppenheimer losing his clearance and now getting it back. Uh, Parsons and others also examined the damage from a similar disaster in Halifax, Nova Scotia of November 1917, as well as accounts of the great Siberian meteor, June 30th of 1908. At V-Site, the Fat Man component is being readied for a shake test to ensure survival in a vibrating aircraft. They were simulating the aircraft being at 30,000 feet, which is what Enola Gay was at. Weaponizing both Little Boy and Fat Man required quite a bit of ingenuity. Other tests conducted at V-Site included the use of dry ice to simulate temperatures at high altitude. Uh, Bryn and De Sabatini are the two men here. Without these persons with these skills, one cannot build a bomb. Now, this is Max Titler from Oak Ridge, whom I happened to meet accidentally, and this is the fun of being a historian. John and I went to visit my mother in Florida. Uh, we found out that there were uh, a couple who um, had been here during the Manhattan Project days, and so we went to talk to them. He, they didn't want me to record their interview, but we got a recording later from Cindy Kelly of them. But when I asked him how was the material brought from Oak Ridge to Los Alamos, he said, well, the guy I play golf with just lives down the street. I'll call him up and he can tell you. <laughs> and so Max, Max sent me a story and um, it was printed in one of the, one of the uh, newsletters of the Historical Society although I couldn't find my copy. This is what he wrote to me, and I hope it makes sense to the scientists here in the room. The plutonium was set down from Hanford, Washington. Aside from the security aspect, there is nothing dangerous in the casual handling. You could hold a slug of plutonium in your hand if you had no cuts or open sores. The A-bomb required a specific weight of plutonium in two separate shapes. They were kept apart with the trigger in between. 
When the two plutonium masses were combined around the trigger, it would start a self-sustaining and instant chain reaction, releasing the energy of the plutonium. My part with three and later seven GIs, some of them here, uh, Max is sitting on the hood right there in the middle, was to transport the trigger to Santa Fe, where it was picked up and driven to Los Alamos. They never came to Los Alamos. They stopped short of the hill and were met by security people, I presume. The schedule was determined by timing of the bomb. The chemical we carried had been irradiated in the pile at X10 in Oak Ridge. It was highly radioactive and became more so during the trip. Its high energy gamma rays were the means of setting off the bomb when all elements were combined. And they had it uh, on a trailer behind whatever they were driving. So that's, that's a fun little story. Um, Well, um, many people in Los Alamos have probably heard of the British mission. The scientists assigned to Los Alamos during the war, Jim Tuck or Klaus Fuchs, the British provided one technical solution to the engineering problems at the lab, their aircraft bomb hook. Here's Parsons' assessment of the hook, including the need for repeated testing. I don't think you can read. Uh, what he's written down there. He was someone who was very, very thorough, and he would insist that everything be tested and um, declared usable, if not reliable. He says, very interesting and in instructive. Design tests of F mecha mechanisms seem good, but not repeated enough to be statistical. Service performance appears to be good. Design tests of G mechanism, if uh, fully reported here, checked strength but not reliably of operation. And those are his notes. So uh, I think this is tongue in cheek, but I have inserted this picture from uh, Harlow Russ's book, um, which you can still get at the Historical Society gift shop. This is a jewel. If you don't have this book, go buy it tomorrow morning. Uh, it is a jewel to know the details that um, you don't read in other books. But anyway, there's the, I believe, that must be the hook, the aircraft bomb hook, if it was tested, and I'm sorry, I can't, say for sure, but maybe someone in the audience can tell us at the end of the talk. And because they were still without airplanes, uh, that the 509th, they were still uh, raising, using machinery to, to lift the various bomb uh, designs. So here, we're at Wendover Air Force Base in Utah, Nevada, and they are putting um, the bomb into a pit, which I'll talk about in a minute. The, um, because the B-29 bombers were very, what they call, low slung, um, they had to put the bombs in a hole, in a pit, uh, and then and then uh, move the airplane over the hole. Now, I spent $6,000 going on a trip, a military tour, just to see this hole. Continue. And, and one of the thing, things that was a bonus was getting to go to Iwo Jima, which you can only do once a year. And um, um, Bill Hudson went, and I went. Bill Hudson went twice. Um, but so if you want to go on that tour, see me afterwards. But, but this is what they were doing, and they were practicing the solution to constructing the loading pits in which the bombs would be lowered. 
and then, as I said, position the airplane is positioned over the, the holes. Now, um, Parsons insisted that they practice over and over and over and over. And um, here, little boy is painted uh, uh, two, two colors so they wouldn't mix it up with the real thing. And uh, uh, this is a practice. It's painted differently. And this is Fat Man, and it's painted differently. And and there you can see it being loaded into a B-29. Now the loading pits, the loading pits were, uh, there were four of them and two of them were constructed at Window Field in Utah for training and two were in constructed in Tinian um, for combat operations. Um, as Roger said, if you know the person who has a key to open up the glass cover, you can go down inside, which some of the people did on my tour. But it's very, 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 very hot, 180 degrees in the summer. Now, one of the values of paying, spending $6,000 to go on a tour is that you find out that only one of the pits was ever used. It, the same pit was used for both atomic bombs. And you wouldn't know that in a book. You wouldn't read that in a book. Um, and so um, after the war, there was a pit uh, uh, built at Kirtland Air Force Base, which Rogers says you could see from the airplane as you took off on your commercial flight. So Parsons was highly thought of by Oppie and others. He was, before his formal appointment, as one of the first associate directors. And then, according to Roger, he was accepted as the number two person in the lab. John Hopkins is here, and he's talked about there's another person who was number two. But I think this, I, I can't tell you exactly. We'll have to have a discussion about it. But anyway, the point is he was well thought about by the people who worked for him and with him because he was open to ideas and he tried to work to, to work together with the Army, Navy, and uh, also the, labor the scientists and the military. And um, you can see that, that picture of him with his hair sticking out is not very complimentary. Um, and so in the summer of 1945, he organized and led the lab group named Project Alberta, or Project A, which assembled the little boy and the fat man on Tinian. And then here is a group photo. Um, and Deke is, maybe you can see Deke. Oh, come on. This has to, oh, here we go. There's Deke. And here are the other two, these three men, were the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I have, there's also tells in this book who is whom. Um, I won't take the time to point out others, but there were 50, more than 50 men from Los Alamos who were sent over to assemble the bombs. Here's a photo of the 509th compound on Tinian. There were other pictures I could have put in here, pictures of the movie theater, the outside movie theater, where they would go to relax if they had the time. Um, the 509th was there, and they were very angry that they got pushed out of um, the, the 393rd uh, uh, units were very angry that the 509th would get the better facilities. There were 15 pilots and, and crew members, about 10 to 11 p crew members to each plane. And um, so we could have dropped a lot of atomic bombs because we had the equipment, we had the, the, the backup. Now, when I read this, this book by 
uh, Harlow Russ a long time ago talked about one of the men who was going to assemble the bomb was almost killed by a Japanese sniper who was still in the jungle. They hadn't cleaned out all of the Japanese who, when they um, uh, won the island. And Japanese would, planes would fly over and uh, they would shoot at them and try to take them down. So we're still in a war, you know, it's not peaceful. It's still, uh, you have to watch yourself. Um, the custody and the use of the first atomic bombs rested with these three officers. Parsons, Admiral William Purnell in the middle, and General Thomas Farrell, collectively known as the Tinian Joint Chiefs of Staff. Admiral per Purnell represented the Military Use Committee and the Joint Chiefs of Staff back in Washington. He was the one that said go. He was the one that had the authority to say go or not go. General Farrell represented General Groves and the MED. And Captain Parsons, of course, was in charge of combat operations. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, oh, you skipped two. Here, Parsons is talking to another ordnance engineer, Roger Warner. And then the man whose back is to us is Commander Frederick Ashworth. Uh, we had Commander Ashworth here to, to give a talk about what happened on the um, flight when we dropped the bomb in Nagasaki. And that's recorded too. Um, that was a bunch of years ago, but we still have it. When people wanted to know uh, why there wasn't access to the gallons of gasoline, uh, which made them have to abort their, or to, to, to land in Okinawa and not in, back in, in Tinian. So we see his back, and he, he um, Ashworth was the uh, weaponier, and he armed fat man in flight. He is the one that chose Tinian. Uh, he was assigned by, by um, Parsons to choose an island for uh, setting up the assemblies for the bomb. And this is a pre-flight pre pre briefing. And it's a well-known photograph. And last month's speaker so I think someone asked him, well, who are the men sitting there listening? They were men of the crews that were going to fly um, to accompany Enola Gay. They were um, the, the B-29 crews, and, uh, the Great Artiste, and number 91, with the plane that's called number 91. I don't know its other name. And they, 91 was to take photos an artiste was to measure, had measuring instruments. And there's Deke next to a Quonset hut. Well, um, De as I told you, Deke was very thorough. So he had three different areas with the Quonset hut, down, with everything replicated down to the screwdriver. One was in California, one was in Tinian, and the other was on Iwo Jima. Because if there was a problem after they took off from Tinian, they could land in Iwo Jima. And they actually, they, Enola Gay did stop there and check things out and then went on. But that's how thorough Parsons was. And um, let's go a little bit more. All that is left of the Quonset hut and the 509th compound is just uh, concrete patches the jungle is periodically cut back for tours and inspections or special events. And uh, this was one of the men authors that was with us on this tour. And that says bomb assembly number one, which I'll explain in a minute. And um, now this shows Tinian and we're looking north. We're looking from Saipan to Tinian, and Guam is on the other end. And I 
highlighted those three different squares. And those are the three assembly places that were built to assemble the bombs. Now, I can't tell you if Fat Man was assembled in a different one place than the, uh, um, the other bomb, but those were three, and you can see from up above. And then the North Field. Um, you take off. And these were all B-29s that flew the conventional bombing, and we destroyed 66 Japanese cities by conventional bombing. Um, this map shows the bombing mission for the conventional B-29s. Note that Niigata, which is up north, is up here. Hiroshima, Kokura, and Nagasaki were no-nos. They weren't supposed to touch those cities because they were listed as possible sites for the atomic dropping. This, I love this map. Um, it was, this is a tile map in a mausoleum in Manila. And this shows why it was so important for America to take Iwo Jima. It was because as our B-29s would fly, they would be so close to Iwo Jima that the Japanese could radio to the homeland and say who was on their way. And so um, we lost 6,000 Marines and the Japanese, 22,000 Japanese, never went home. And you maybe have seen the movies about I Iwo Jima. But um, let's see, there were 10 men in every crew, and 2,000 B 29s used Iwo Jima as a backup uh, who were injured from dropping conventional bombs on Japan. So it was worth the lives of those Marines to whom we give homage. Um, let's see. Little boys being loaded in. Okay, let's see. I... Oh, okay. Um, so, um, B 29s that were loaded to take off were so loaded down that some of them would crash before they would take off. And so instead of arming the, the bomb, um, arming Enola Gay, um, little boy, um, Parsons decided that it would be better to do it in flight. And so because of that, he practiced and he practiced and he practiced. And these, this chart up here is the checklist. And um, it's kind of hard, you know, take out the green plugs, put in the red, uh, remove this plate, that plate, and it's in sequence. And then down below, in case there's going to be a crash, he's to reverse the checklist, and he's the last one to leave the plane, if he survives that long. So he has to go up and arm the plane before it reaches 10,000 feet, because after that he's going to need oxygen. So um, working in a very cramped bomb bay, Parsons, along with Morris Jepson, arms little boy before the Enola Gay passes through the 10,000 feet. Now. There you see the bomb being put in by hydraulic lift, put into the belly of Enola Gay. And this is a picture I got from Leon Smith, whom some of you may know. Leon was, worked at Sandia, and uh, he was, he lost the, Bet with the, um, what's his name, the man that helped, Morris Jepson. 
If, if Morris hadn't won, then Leon Smith would have been the person that it went up on Enola Gay with Deke Parsons to arm the bomb. And I'm reading from the book, Silent Voices, that came out many years ago and I hope will come out again this year. Just before their takeoff on August 6, 1945, from Tinian, the Pacific island located 2,000 miles from Hiroshima, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tibbetts and each of his B-29 crew members were handed a cyanide capsule to swallow in case they were captured. The U.S. Marines had invaded Tindian a year previously in order to provide a bomber base with striking distance of Japan. The Enola Gay took off in the darkness at 2.45 a.m., clearing the end of the two-mile runway with only 100 feet to spare. While taking off, the B-29 passed the burned remains of four B-29s that had crashed the previous night. The wreckage had been bulldozed to the side of runway A. The Enola Gay weighed 65 tons at takeoff, eight tons overweight. It carried a single bomb nicknamed Little Boy, which weighed five tons. This gun-type uranium bomb developed by J. Robert Oppenheimer and the Manhattan scientists at Los Alamos contained batteries which had to be kept charged during the long flight. Also, the bomb could not get too cold. At 7.30 a.m., Captain Deke Parsons inserted the red plugs in Little Boy. Now the weapon was fully armed. It rode in the B-29's bomb bay, glistening black. An hour before Nola Gay's departure, another B-29 straight flush, a weather plane, had taken off from Tinian for Hiroshima. The weather plane radioed a coded message to the Enola Gay identified as Dimples 82. Remember 82. That the skies were clear over the target. This signal was the death sentence for Hiroshima. So when they came back, there was a crowd that rushed to greet them. Around 350 people had greeted them before they left at 2.45 in the morning. But the um, General Carl Spatz, the US Air Force, immediately puts a pin on, on Tibbetts and gives him the Distinguished Service Cross. It's the highest honor given for the mission. Now I'm going to do an aside and advertise for the lecture next September. Hiroshima was a military city. The Japanese Second Army was located there. 30,000 Korean conscripts were part of those who died in the dropping of the bomb. And I'm doing more research on the number of members of the Second Army. And when you read about it was innocent children and women and old people, it's only partially true because it was a military city and there were military people who were killed by the dropping of the bomb. I'll go into that more detail next September when I've been invited to talk about the response to the surrender. Because of military politics. The army controlled both the bomb and the mission. Parsons received a lesser award, the Silver Star, in private, in a room, by himself, with a general, one-star general, General John H. Davies. But he was later given a better award because Groves was furious. Groves knew of the work that Parsons had done, and so he, he um, was able to get a, the Distinguished Service Medal for Parsons, but it still was not the same level as what Tibbetts got, the Army man. And as Roger Mead says, as he did not drive a, a plane, 
he did not command a ship. He just armed the atomic bomb and controlled the project to prepare for the mission. And so Roger feels very strongly that this was a terrible slight. And that's one reason uh, Parsons is so modest, at which you'll find out. And so that's one slight. And of course, what's coming up in this is the competition between the Army and the Navy, which was very pronounced in those days. I think we, yes. This takes five seconds. It's not working, is it? Hmm? This is an interview. Oh, I'm supposed to push it. Thank you. This is Captain William Sterling Parsons, United States Navy of Fort Sumner, New Mexico. Captain Parsons made the original trip with the atomic bomb ship Enola Gay as weaponeer. He is in the theater as scientific head of the atomic bomb project. Captain Parsons, will you tell us briefly the story of your trip from takeoff to target? After a photographing session that make it, made us feel like a Hollywood premiere, <laughs> we uh, got off at about uh, 3 o'clock in the morning in the darkness and headed for Iwo Jima, which we reached about sunrise. We made uh, certain adjustments and tests on the bomb during that flight. We then headed for the Empire, and uh, the weather improved as we went along. We felt that it was our lucky day, and we knew it was as we made the final approach toward Hiroshima, which the navigator hit right on the button. The bombardier took over, identified the target, and everything went with perfection not approached in the rehearsals. The bomb was finally released exactly at the designated hour, and the explosion occurred as planned. That's it on that. But the Navy raised him up to be a Commodore, and a Commodore was an obsolete title. And so that was the Navy's politics, according to Roger. Um, he did, and part of it was, okay, so he comes back as Commodore. And if you notice on uh, that handout about the Oppenheimer statues, Oppenheimer and Grove statues, it has Commodore, it doesn't say um, uh, Admiral, and it doesn't say Captain, it says Commodore. So somebody really did their homework, and I think it was was it me? I thought it was you. I, I, I don't remember. But um, it's accurate, according to this. So um, Parsons doesn't, doesn't complain. And he's on the podium getting the E Award. I really don't know what the E Award is. I didn't have time to, to look that up. Maybe someone from the Historical Society can tell us at the end. So he leaves Los Alamos in November of 45. And he's assigned to the office of the Chief of Naval Operations, where he is to begin planning for the first post-war test of an atomic bomb, Operation Crossroads. And he asks Ashworth to assist. And uh, this is where the Navy kind of got a fast one over the army. <laughs> the idea for the crossroads came from several places. Um, Spatz claimed that the army was in charge, but a congressman, uh, U.S. Senator Brian McMahon, wanted to use the captured Japanese ships 
for tests. And the battle commanders in the Pacific were interested also in testing the atomic weapons uh, fierceness. And uh, the Navy was anxious to see how its fleet would stand up to an atomic bomb. And so there you see some pictures of the test. Now, the Navy held a long-standing grudge against the Army for Army Billy Mitchell bombing off the Ostfriedland uh, ship in 1922. And I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't know German, I, should it be Ostfriedland? Was captured, it was a German World War I battleship and it was used for target practice by both the Army and the Navy bombers. The ship withstood almost 60 bombs before sinking, not from a direct hit, but from near misses that ruptured its sides. Now Mitchell bombed the, the um, battleship, um, let's see, I'm losing my place here. Um, he bombed the, the battleship against test protocol and loudly proclaimed victory for the army, despite the fact that the battleship proved remarkably resilient against the air attack. The Navy was angry because Mitchell bombed without authorization and by claiming singular credit made the surface fleet seem overly vulnerable. Um, Parsons with the help of Vice Admiral Frederick Ashworth, did much of the early planning for Crossroads. Parsons, now finally a rear admiral, served as a deputy task force commander. In early summer of 46, the U.S. assembled the world's fourth largest fleet at Bikini Lagoon as targets for the atomic bomb. Ships included the aircraft carrier Lexington and the battleship Nevada. This is Nevada. The first test, an airdrop, missed the Nirvana. It was painted red to enhance its visibility, but there was a lot of damage topside. The Navy owns the ship, the Army owned the planes, and the, and the bombardier missed the target by a half a mile. I don't know why they didn't use the men who in the 509th, who were all trained to do this. The um, next second test, oops, sorry, was an underwater burst. Baker caused more damage to the ships, and like the 1922 test, damage from the shock of the hulls of the ships was most effective. Only 12 ships were sunk, and that still was the fourth fleet, which was the largest fleet. So both Army and Navy claimed victories. Uh, with the passage of the Atomic Energy Act, Parsons was appointed to the Military Liaison Committee, the Military Advice Funding Committee for Atomic Tests. Parson also became the Deputy Task Force Commander of the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project, again serving under General Groves. Um, he also served as the Deputy Commander for Operation Sandstone in 1948. During the planning for Sandstone, Parsons, for the second time, ventured into the world of physics, suggesting a new type of bomb for the tests, which upset Bradbury. Stick to your knitting, he was told. Parsons subsequently achieved his goal of a seagoing command before reassignment to the Pentagon. Here is his flagship and the USS Macon, fittingly the last cruiser to carry heavy armament. Can you remember how much Groves wanted a command, wanted to go overseas and not be, do the Pentagon and not do the Manhattan Project? And that would be the same for Parsons. Parsons became visibly upset on December 4th, 1953. This is very important because of the Oppenheimer movie coming up. 
He became visibly upset in December 4, 1953, when President Eisenhower put up a blank wall between the government and Oppenheimer. Now, that was secretly leaked within the Navy. It wasn't public yet. The, pub the other announcements came later in de the month of December. But um, uh, Deke, Deke uh, was very upset. And they said, well, we'll go play golf tomorrow and uh, calm down. And um, they started out, he, he had, had uh, pains the night before, Saturday night, and he, Martha found him reading a medical book about his symptoms. And I guess he didn't have a certain symptom, so he thought he was okay. And he would go play golf the next day. Well. He had an attack on Sunday morning, and they went to the hospital, and he died 15 minutes after he was admitted. So Martha believed this treatment of Oppenheimer precipitated the heart attack, which took his life. So what, how would history be different if Parsons had been able to testify? at Oppie's, uh, Oppie's hearings, I think, I think he would have created perhaps a different solution. We can talk about that. That would be a lot of fun, I think, to talk about. Because Parsons adored Oppie, and Oppie adored Parsons. Adored, maybe, not but respected. Um, so he's buried at Arlington Cemetery next to his daughter Hannah, who died as a young girl, and his father-in-law, who was the admiral. And in 1957, the Navy commissioned a destroyer with Parsons' name in recognition of his wartime service and accomplishments. His widow Martha had christened the destroyer. And there is a summary of what I've been talking about of what he has accomplished. However, the ship was decommissioned and sunk for target practice in 1987. And, but there were other honors that were bestowed upon him. On July, not, July 2010, the Los Alamos County Council adopted a proclamation for the Tinian tribute to the Manhattan Project Symposium. It mentioned Oppie and Deke in charge of Operation Centerboard, which is, was the uh, Operation Alberta. There, and as I said, there were about 50 men from Los Alamos who uh, were there to, to uh, assemble the bomb parts. The proclamation is there, and it talks about it. it and um, Roger Mead and I took it to Tinian as we were invited to come and be, as historians tell about what went on in Los Alamos uh, during World War II. And <laughs> this, this is an auditorium. We're in an auditorium, and so that's quite a banner. You can't miss it. And um, the mayor of, of Tinian Island Tinian Island, he's, that's a, it's called a mayor, but it's an island, it's not a city. But he's the mayor of Tinian Island. And he accepted the proclamation from Los Alamos. And this was something that um, helped to tie the two communities together. And we should stay tied together, I believe. It was a two-day symposium. And these Air Force officers of the Pacific, leading commanders, sat there for two days listening to the history of Tinian's contribution to World War II. I was extremely impressed. Here, there was a ceremony on August 6th, and uh, wreaths were moved, and, and uh, they were singing and military ceremony, as we do for our own here. But I was very impressed with the fact that the Air Force men wanted to learn the history of World War II. 
Now in 2009, when Larry Campbell was our president, uh, Roger gave a talk. He said, this one is much better than the one I gave in 2009. And Claire, uh, Claire Parsons Fuller, his, one of his daughters, was here and she was signing uh, the book that was written about him. There are not very many uh, bios of, of Deke Parsons, but um, the program was to honor Jer and Hadine, Helene Sudam because they knew Deke and that's what they wanted. They wanted, uh, they had just um, for, well, they didn't forgive the debt then, but um, this was to honor them. And it's so wonderful that we have PAC-8 recording these talks because it's great to see people in the audience who are gone, who were my friends. And there I'm talking to the Fort Sumner High School classes. They knew of uh, Atomic Admiral because his family lived there. His younger brother lost an eye at Iwo Jima. And in fact, um, after Pars Parsons flew around the Trinity site, they were in a plane that observed the explosion. And then they flew to Los Angeles where he checked in on his brother who was in the hospital. And then he flew on to Tinian. That's the kind of man he was. But his younger brother became the high school teacher, history high school teacher in Fort Sumner. And so um, he's retired now, he's moved to Roswell, but uh, that's why all those kids clapped when I showed the picture of, uh, of Deke on the, uh, on the screen. And so, um, here we are again, the village of the, of the home of the Rear Admiral William D. Parsons, the Atomic Admiral. Deke was instrumental in expanding his Section Z to Sandia after the war to encourage its growth and contributions. I'm not aware what Sandia does to honor Deke. I know what he, they do to honor Leon Smith. So if anyone knows, Please let me know. He encouraged Norris Bradbury to hang in there when Norris was having problems about the future of the lab. And um, how can Los Alamos recognize his extraordinary contributions? Uh, members of the Historic Preservation Board are now seeking your ideas of ways to remember Deke. Um, I'm on the subcommittee with with uh, the chairman um, and who had visited Tinian Island last May. And he's very, very eager for us to find a way to honor, honor Dee. The author Al Chrisman of Target Hiroshima writes in the end, Deke Parsons' legacy goes beyond military decoration, honorary science degrees, street names, ships, and buildings, it lives on in the advanced weaponry and technology of the American Armed Forces, rigorous standards in nuclear weapons training, and a philosophy of military scientific cooperation for military research and development. And Ron, Roger Mead wanted to share General Grove's impressive comment. And that's it. Thank you. I, I usually don't read uh, when I speak. I usually look at the picture and talk. So I apologize for reading tonight, but I wanted to be accurate. And also I was reading for Roger's sake as well as my own. I hope I was all right. My mouth got very, very dry. Um, but um, thank you for coming and thank you for honoring Deke um, tonight by being here. Um, I'm really, really serious. What can we do to, to um, show how the, bom how the idea for the bombs got translated to transcribed to what helped to stop the war in Japan? 
So I'll take a few questions. Do we have any? You all were wonderful. I noticed you didn't drop a pin. And you didn't laugh too much, because I didn't have too much humor in the talk. But um, I thank you. And I know there's a lot of detail in here. But you guys are up to it because of your scientific background. And it's amazing how many leadership positions he was assigned to. And he, he didn't claim to be a scientist. He didn't get a Nobel Prize. He, he just did the ordinance, which was the nitty gritty. So thank you very much. Yes? Uh huh. Towards the front of your talk, there was a slide that was from um, saying, I understand your position is to <clears throat> in the begin in the very beginning. There was a slide that had a picture of both Oppenheimer and Parsons. And yeah. The quote on the slide. Yes. Something to the effect that I never it was never my intention to presume to tell you what components to use in the device. And it was unclear who was saying whose quote that was. Right? That that's an obvious Parsons? Yes. I can go back, but yeah. Since since you uh, brought me up, uh, this, uh, I thought I would uh, try to explain what this was. Since there were really two major parts of this program. One the scientific part and one at the military delivery part. Uh, Robert Bacher, uh, a physicist from Caltech, was the one who, in the scientific arena, was the one who was the number two guy. Now, uh, uh, when it got really into the military part, uh, obviously uh, Parsons was the senior person. And uh, so in that sense, to Oppie, he was a number two person. Uh, the engineering part, uh, uh, making this device into a bomb, uh, became uh, the uh, responsibility of C Division. And Z Division, before the end of the war, was moved to Albuquerque. And uh, that, in the late 40s, became Sandia Laboratories. And they still have the responsibility for the vast majority of bits and pieces to go into a bomb compared to the uh, scientists' physics package. But anyway, that's... Uh, Thank you for clearing that up. We're both right. <laughs> Questions? All right, well, let's give it up for Nancy one more time. It's almost. So now comes the fun, you guys. We are going to auction off the sand. And what's nice about living in Los Alamos, you don't have to pay for it tonight. You bring me your credit card tomorrow. So, we're going to start off with the sand from Iwo Jima. We're going to start it off at $150. Oh. Anybody taking it? Oh, you guys, come on. $150 towards the Alzheimer House renovation fund? There it is. Yes. All right, we have $150. Come on. Who else? 200, we're looking for 200, you guys, come on. $200? One, going once, going twice. Wayne, was that a, was that a bid or were you just scratching your eye? All right. All right. All right. All right. Well, I'll take this a bit though, you sure that was not too much. All right. $200. All right, one last time, here we go. All right, it's gone for $150. Yay. Yay. 
start right there again. 100, we're going to start at 100 this time. All right, there we go. Sir, we've got 100. We're looking for 150 now. Come on, y'all. All right, thank you, Georgia. 150, we're looking for 200, y'all. Come on. Come on. Sam's a time right here, you guys. <laughs> that, that was used to do the runways by the Seabees. There you go. Where else are you going to get a little Sam like this? All right, I guess it's going once, twice, and that's it. All right, well, thank you all for coming to the Seabees.